First Kings 17. <clears throat> I'm talking today about um, by the brook, by the brook there, another title could be serving God in the Selah, Selah means a pause, a time of thought and meditation, how do we serve God then, and why we're by that brook, I wanted to set the setting, so keep your finger in 1 Kings chapter 17, we'll be there. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 11. In verse 43 it says, And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. There in chapter 12 it says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass, when Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous, and now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father, while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old man, which had given him, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye, that we may answer this people, who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which my father did put upon us lighter? And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins, and now, whereas my father did lay ye with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered, and the people roughly, he answered the people roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young man, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which he spake, Bahijah and the, the Shilonite, unto Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation, and made him king over all Israel. And there was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. 
And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, and hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, and to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the word of the Lord, and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. So here we see the kingdom has been divided, and it's according to the word of, the God, word of God. He says it several times. The man of God came by the word of the Lord and proclaimed such a thing, even saying that the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform that very saying there in verse 15. And so the nation that was united under Solomon was now divided unto Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam comes out and in pride and stoutness of heart for the counsel that he received from the young men that grew up with him, and here's some wisdom there, young men that are here. Look to the counsel of the elder before you ask your peers some advice. Because following his peers' advice, he did not pull back in the great servitude that he expected of the people of the nation. Solomon had built a great temple. Solomon had built many wonderful things in his time. And he worked his people very hard. He was a glorious king. He was, he was an all-encompassing king, ruling over most of the known world at that time, at least in his influence. And when everything was built and Solomon had passed away, the people simply said, we've lived in this peace, but we've been working and toiling through it. Would you pull back on some of the work and, and pull back on your father's heavy yoke? Then we will serve you forever. And that's exactly what the old men said. The young men said, nah, tell them that you're pinky finger is going to be thicker than your father's loins and you're going to chastise them with scorpions you know really show your influence and it was the wrong decision the kingdom divided in that moment and most of them became that northern kingdom under jeroboam when he had returned and the southern kingdom of rehoboam was nothing but the children of judah and a few other scattered remnants of the tribes and so they actually went out to fight and to bring those northern kingdoms back under Rehoboam. But the prophet again spoke by the word of the Lord and said, Don't do this. Don't fight. Don't go up against your brethren. This thing is of God, that he may perform the word which he told his prophets. Continuing in verse 25, it said, Then Jeroboam, this is the king of the northern kingdom, built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. So while Rehoboam showed great pride in trying to establish himself as this firm and, and hard leader, Jeroboam showed his insecurity and figuring that the people would just gravitate back to the nation, though they were greatly offended at the, the basically threats of Rehoboam the king. And so he says in his heart in verse 26, the kingdom will return to David. Verse 27, he gives his reasoning why. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even Rehoboam, king of Judah. They shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now, I don't think that would have taken place. Why? Because God had said that this was of him, and he had established that there would be peace at this time. That nation was divided at the word of God, but because of his insecurity and because of his own self-will in this matter, he decided he was going to do something about what he foresaw as a problem in the kingdom, something that would threaten his authority in the, northern, in the north parts. Verse 28, it says, Whereupon the king took counsel, again, asking counselors, probably not the wise men, probably not the elder at this time, he said, and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. 
two golden calves. We've seen this before when a singular one was made at the base of the mount as Moses went up to get the commandments. But now he made two calves of gold and said, these are the gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 29, it says, and he set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Bethel being at the southernmost part of that northern kingdom and Dan being at the farthest northern part of that kingdom. So in other words, he's saying that everybody in the middle can go up north or can go down south, but either way they'll be headed off from returning to Judah and doing their sacrifice there. He invented these gods in order to preserve his authority and his power, even though his authority and his power actually came from the word of the Lord. Verse 30, it says, And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. He's basically inventing his own religion here, isn't he? Verse 32, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. So he gives them something to counter the feast of the Lord. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places, which he had made. So he offered upon the altar, which he had made in Bethel, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even the month which he had devised of his own heart. Look at that. Devised of his own heart. And three other places above, I believe it says, which he had made, which he had made, which he had made. He devised this of his own heart, it says, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burned incense. Turn to the right to 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14. Remember it said, that thing became a sin unto them. In 1 Kings chapter 14, look with me in verse 7. <clears throat> the prophet here is given the command, in charge, go tell Jeroboam, 1 Kings 14, verse 7, go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee priests over my people Israel and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but hast done evil above all that were before thee, for thou hast gone and made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man that taketh away dung till it be gone. Refuse, just tossing them away as a result of his great sin. God shows, I established thee, I cared for thee, I exalted thee among the people, I gave you most of my nation to lead, but you've not followed as David, who is often that great example Followed as David, followed as David, and now you're going to see a switch. The opposite, and those that do evil, they didn't follow after David, but they're going to be shown as those that followed in the ways of Jeroboam. Certainly this thing that he did became a sin, and certainly Jeroboam at this time became a byword unto the people of Israel. 1 Kings chapter 15 and verse 33, look at this. We're going to see in that chapter, if you read it, Kings rising, kings falling, kings rising, kings falling. Most of them doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Most of them walking in the way of their father, who is going to be likened unto what we see here in verse 33. And it says, In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Baasha, the son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel in Terzah twenty and four years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. That was the idolatry. That was changing the laws of God, changing the commands of God, and the and this ordinance of God into his own thing, and setting up new gods 
that the people knew not and saying, these be thy gods. These be those that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And this thing became a sin unto Jeroboam. He became a byword. And from this point on, whenever anybody wants to bring up a negative example, it's always, you did as Jeroboam did. You did as Jeroboam did. He did evil in the sight of the Lord as Jeroboam his father did. And so this is the setting that we have here. If we were, if we would, we already saw this. Um, Omri was worse, and we can turn to 1 Kings chapter 16. That's what I did here. 1 Kings chapter 16, and look at verse 25. But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Vanities, emptiness, nothingness, the idols that they served. That great sin that they made in setting those idols up is simply following in the steps of the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Omri here doing worse than all those that were before him. But now look at verse 29. It says, And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa king of Judah began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. It says it's a light thing for him to just serve Jeroboam's gods that he set up. But not only that, he takes it a step further, marries this wicked heathen wife, Jezebel, and begins to serve Baal and worship him. This isn't just making up gods and serving them. This is literally turning over to serving the devil himself. Baal being this, this archetypal sinful god, the serpent of old, that all of these Zidonians and all of these of northern tribes and those of the people of Israel, uh, of, of the land of Canaan that should have been thrown out, had served from antiquity. Baal. You're serving Baal, you're marrying the, the, the daughter of Baal, you're going and, and linking up with Eth Baal, king of the Zidonians. It's such a wicked thing here that Jeroboam had did, greater than all that were before him. Verse 32, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. In his days did Heel, the Bethlehemite, build Jericho, and he laid the foundation. And that's a story that fulfills Joshua 6 and 23. We'll leave off there. The point being, Ahab did more to provoke God than any king before him. And this is the stage for what we're going to talk about with Elijah. We look around at our nation and we see, is, was it ever this bad? Was it ever this wicked? Had it ever been to this point where our leaders were worshiping and serving the devil the way they do? I think it's, been, it's never really been worse, but I also don't think it's as bad as what's being experienced here. Literally, temples of the devil being reared up and worship openly done by our leaders. They at least keep it somewhat private and behind closed doors for now. But enter Elijah at this time, and I'm going to hold off from reading the entirety of chapter 17. I, I believe we've given good attendance under reading, just in that, to set the stage. But what we have here is the story of Elijah and the beginning of his ministry and the setting firmly established what he was walking into. Verse 1 there of chapter 17 says, In Elijah the Tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So Elijah steps forward and confronts the king. Who is this Elijah? Well, this is the first time we've ever heard of him. Nobody knows. <laughs> he just walks out and boldly says to Ahab, it says there very clearly, Elijah said unto Ahab, he makes the proclamation and it, he says, this will only come to fruition and end according to my word. What boldness. 
Now, most of the prophets contained in the previous three or four chapters that you see, when they spoke, it would say this saying before. It would say, the word of the Lord came unto such and such, the prophet, and he said. But we don't find this with Elijah, do we? The first time Elijah steps onto the scene, there is no, the word of the Lord came. There is no, and God spake unto Elijah. There is nothing like that. A, a, a strong indication of God telling Elijah to say these words. Nevertheless, in boldness, he comes before Ahab and says to him, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Here Elijah comes out and he boldly states, according to my words, this shall not happen. Rain will fall. Where did Elijah then get the authority to do such a thing? And to make such a bold statement, as God liveth, as the Lord liveth, as true as the Lord is, this shall not come to pass. It will not rain until I say so. Where did he get that authority to say such things? The same place as those other prophets. So while it doesn't draw it immediately to our attention, go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, keeping your finger there. While it immediately doesn't draw to our attention, you know, thus saith the Lord, or the word of the Lord came unto Elijah. Elijah is simply here proclaiming the word of God that he had believed by faith. Remember, he's now in a position where the southern kingdom is full of pride and is mostly relinquished to the north. It's weakened. The northern kingdom has gone into full-blown idolatry so that the king there not only does according to the sins of Jeroboam, that first king, but he takes it a step further and literally serves and worships the devil, provoking God to anger. Elijah steps up and says, according to my word, it's not going to rain. And he did this all based on the word of the Lord. Look at in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and in verse 10. Deuteronomy 11 and verse 10. It says, For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not a land, is not as the land of Egypt, from whence ye came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass if, there it is, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in thy field for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain. And that the land yield not her fruit, lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Is Elijah stepping onto the scene in a land that loves the Lord thy God with all their heart? Is he stepping into a land where they are keeping all of the commands of God and serving him with their heart and their soul and their mind? Or is he walking into a land that fits, verse 16, that has turned aside and served other gods and worshipped him? I believe Elijah simply went to the scriptures and he looked around him and he saw my nation, this nation under King Ahab is one that has turned aside and served other gods and worshipped them and what saith the scriptures regarding a land like that? Do you know what it says? No rain. No rain. The rain will be shut up. There will be not former nor latter rain in the land. There will be not care for the corn and for the wine and for the oil. Grass in the field will wither up. They will perish quickly from off the good land which God gave them. Back in 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah just went to the Bible. And he saw that that nation was not following God wholly. And he said, you know what one of the fruits of your doings is? No rain. 
And he walked before the king and said, Thus saith the Lord here, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, and he appealed to the scriptures and said, Take heed that you turn not aside. You have already turned aside. Therefore the Lord's wrath is kindled against you. Therefore it will not rain until I say so. And he added that, I believe, according to my word. Elijah probably didn't know if it would be one year, two years, three years, but he knew what the Bible said with regard to idolatry and wickedness in God's land. He said it will not rain. And that's exactly what Elijah went and according to his word said unto Ahab. You too can go to Deuteronomy and look at people in your lives and look at yourself and look at the surroundings and look at the cities and the nations and you can proclaim the exact same truths unto them because these words are true in any context. If ye will diligently seek me and obey me and follow me, blessings. If you will not, curses. And we've learned about that in our study of Deuteronomy. That still applies. And that's exactly what Elijah did. He trusted the word of God by faith and just told it to the king. You know what? When we go and we preach the gospel or we warn people about their sins or we try to turn them under righteousness, we do the same thing. God will judge you firmly and harshly for this sin. And we simply proclaim, there will be no rain. You will be cursed in your field. You will be cursed in your storehouse if you do not repent of this thy wickedness. He just had the faith and the guts to actually outright say it. Proclaim the curses for their disobedience. Reign as dust, it says in another place. Elijah's faith in what God said allowed him to issue this word forth. And then it came to pass. So much so that Elijah is referred to in the next chapter as the man that troubleth Israel. How could he be named such a thing? He didn't trouble Israel. Israel troubled herself. And as a result of Israel's sin and idolatry, they just simply reaped of exactly what God had said. It just so happens Elijah was the one that told them about it and proclaimed to them, it's not going to rain. Well, who is this man that troubleth Israel? It's not me, it's the Bible. That's what it says. This idolatry is causing you to sin, and therefore there will be no rain. This nation certainly troubled herself through this idolatry from the kings. And the people followed in the same, didn't they? Therefore, as a result of the whole nation being given unto this wickedness and this idolatry, they all forced God's hand to do exactly what he promised. And this is what we do. When we're, when we're under God's chastisement, it's because we have forced his hand. God's default to us is love and mercy. But we force his hands by our decision to sin against him, by our decisions to be idolatrous, by our decisions to, to go after the lusts of the flesh. We decide that, and God literally is forced to judge us harshly as he does. And that's a shame, because that's not what God wants. I'm certain that God mourns when he has to chastise his own people. I'm certain that God would rather they chose life in every circumstance. So Elijah simply steps forward and he just declares and states the obvious. God promised a specific punishment to the sin that you are doing. God promised that he would cut off the rain for idolatry. And here you are being in idolatry. Therefore, God is going to cut off the rain. And the thing that we notice here is that when God judges a nation, everyone inevitably feels the pain in some way, shape, or form. But we know of our God that he is diligent to, and faithful to protect those that are following after him, that love him, that are of that remnant. Though we're not necessarily entirely shielded from it. I always think of Noah, right? Noah was kept in a boat, brought up avoiding the flood and kept safe from the flood. But he didn't just escape from it, did he? He still felt the waves. He still, he still probably suffered the seasickness. He was still on a ship with a bunch of stinky animals. One window. He, he went through suffering. I'm sure he missed the farmland that he had and, and, the, and the rich resources. And the, you know, now he's eating old stale food that's, that's kept and dried out. I'm sure he loved the world before, but God certainly brought the judgment on the nations and the world around him and carried him through it. And the same is true for us. We're not going to escape the judgments that come. When we look at the Bible and we see when your nation is in idolatry, it will be famine, it will be pestilence, it will be naked, it will be the sword. Then we have to know that some of those things are going to come upon us, or at least our lifestyle is going to be hindered as a result of the world around us. But we're protected through it. 
always protected through it and sometimes given different responsibilities in it. So here we are in this COVID pandemic and our lives have certainly been influenced by what's going on around us. I believe it's a judgment of God. I believe that the oppressive governments are exactly what the people asked for. If you read comments of people talking about it, they're saying we should make people mask up. If you listen to, I've heard people at my workplace talk about it, they're like, we should just sternly lock everyone down for a whole month. Close the doors and throw away the keys. Basically is what they're in for. Then after this month, all of it will be gone and we can return to normal. They're, they're thinking in, in the wrong way. They want the oppression that the world is putting upon them and unfortunately, we being saved people, blood-bought, children of the king, hopefully faithfully following him, are protected from it. I've had more liberty, I believe, than some of these other people. I walk around unmasked in Walmart, and it doesn't bother me, and there's no one that bothers me, and it's no problem. You know, we, we've been able to gather and meet together when most of the churches, honestly, I believe most of them, because they are under the corporation, blah, 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 paperwork, they actually have more stricter mandates we're just here completely protected in god's hands and, and independent in every sense of the word we've been protected from certain things but our ministry looks different and this is the thing i really want to focus on what do we do by the brook how do we serve god in in a sila in a pause in a in a time of change our ministry certainly looks different everybody knows that over the past couple months maybe month and a half or so We've pulled back a little bit just to get a better view, just to take a break and take a sea law from the door to door to door soling, okay? And sometimes that really bothers me, and I know that sometimes it really bothers you. But I want to deal with what we ought to be doing in these times. Due to our nation and our worlds being judged, and due to the circumstances that are around us, we've went in a direction and i've led us there not explicitly not saying you can or can or must or this or that but we've been leading in a direction where there's a little bit of a different path we're not going out every saturday we're not knocking the doors in the same way we're not sneaking into the apartments like we used to do in the winter time okay things are a little bit different the world is being judged and unfortunately we have to go through this and we have to adapt a little bit through it like elijah did there's a little bit of a break taking place, okay? <clears throat> Elijah went out and bold, went to the government, and he said, as the Lord liveth, there shall be no rain. And as a result, his life completely changed at that moment. You know, we can even say the same thing. As the Lord liveth, the, the rebellion and the throwing him out of schools will cause pestilence to be in your land. We could proclaim such a truth, and that would be according to God's word and according to God's will. That's what happens. A nation such as Canada, who wants nothing to do with God, should not be shocked when pestilence comes upon them, when, when oppressive leaders come upon them, when a strange nation comes and, and oppresses and, and casts down and, 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 and controls its people and brings them into bondage. So before... We had no problem going door to door to door. And everyone here was very faithful to do that week in and week out. And, and, and that was a, a namesake, really just, just the embodiment of this church. It was the heart of this church. And now, <laughs> this winter and this time, we've been leaning to the, you know, the, the soul stroll. We've been ministering to people at home and trying to reach our families and do this and that. But what I want to see here is that even though sometimes... <clears throat> It really bothers me that we're not doing the same thing. I see in a lot of ways that it's, it's what's right at this time. <clears throat> now, because of the change that goes on, certainly criticism can be felt, okay? First source of criticism is people on the outside that don't understand our church. Now, I, I will just give it this, this caveat. We're still assembling publicly, without restrictions, gathering together, breaking those rules. That's a big thing when you look at what everybody else is doing in this nation, just live streaming, you know, brother Josh sitting at home reading, you know, a sermon to you in, in, in my basement or whatever, while y'all of you sit on your phones, right? That's, that's what the world is doing. The, the other churches out there. So just from that standpoint, you are doing a great work. Assembly is a big deal in God's economy and in God's charge to the people of Israel. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So as much as you may get criticized for no outreach, you need to be commended and encouraged in that you're assembling with the believers. And that's important. 
the first source of where criticism can come is from outsiders. There are some that are out there that presume that soul winning is the first works. And I have taught and believe that soul winning is a fruit of the first works, but the first works are this. You know, people will say, well, Jesus, the first thing he did was said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But then do you know what he said? He said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Do you know what then he said? He said, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So if we're going to talk about what first works Christ gave to his church, it's all three of those encompassed. So if we're not doing part two and part three, then we're not doing those first works. But above and beyond that, I believe that the first works, the first heart, the soul, the heartbeat of Jesus when he was in this world is the one that we need to grab a hold of as the first works to us as a church and that is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind and strength and love thy neighbor as thyself and that is the foundation from which the great commission shoots from. So we have the foundation and we build upon it to go and preach the gospel. We build upon it to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son. We build upon that to teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. If we don't have the foundation of love for God and love for our neighbor, it all falls apart. And that's exactly what he taught about the law, didn't he? On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And if and if you have a swing up here and there's two things holding it, one of them is love God and one of them is love the neighbor, if you don't have one, what happens to that swing? Shing. It's good for nothing. That you can't put anything on a swing that has only one, has only one, hang, one hanger. <clears throat> and so that's what I would say. So to those that would attack us and criticize us for not getting out there and going door to door in that same fashion, in that same manner, there are weightier things to the Christian life, weightier matters and bigger foundations and that is to love God and that is to love your neighbor and that is the whole of the scriptures filtered through those two hangs okay those same ones those same people that would charge us for not having the first words because we're not soul winning would be the ones that treat soul winning as if it covers a multitude of sins haven't you seen that Love shall cover a multitude of sins. That's the scripture. But they'll say soul winning shall cover a multitude of sins. They don't outwardly say that. But aren't these great soul winners, a vast majority of them, just rotten Christians, but they're a good soul winner. And you find out they've fallen into all sorts of sins. And they've, they've succumbed to temptations. And, they're, and they're, their family's falling apart. And they're in fornication. And they're, they're living ungodly lives, but I'm a soul winner. And they think that they'll be delivered to do all of these unrighteousnesses because they go on and knock on doors and try to coax people into believing the gospel. So that's where the criticism comes from, and that's what we need to understand. First of all, that the first works are not sowing. The first works are bigger than that. Weightier matters. And also, these treat soul winning as if it's covering the multitude of sins. Rotten person, but he's a soul winner, is what they'll say. So... That's where one form of criticism is coming from. And, and really, when I look at it, I, I'm just like, who cares? Water off a duck's back. Criticize all you want. What happens in sound words stays in sound words. And this is how we do things. This is how we're marching forward at this time. I could give a rip what somebody out there in the world that does not go to our church, that does not care for our church, that is not even going to a church, cares about that and what happens here. So the second form of criticism, and this one is actually important. It comes from self. Aren't we harder on ourselves than, than anybody, especially in this area? Myself personally, because I have not been actively going and knocking on doors as much in the past couple months, I beat myself up all the time. I feel like I'm not doing enough. I feel like I am sinning against God. I feel like I am not in God's will. That criticism is real and legitimate. And I feel that way all the time and it gets me down and it gets me despondent and it gets me sad and it gets me mourning but I have to also bring that into perspective the same way as I would discard the criticism from some of these some of these guys right is the same reason why I should discard this criticism that's coming from myself of course if you're being convicted about something get it right repent and then turn to God but a lot of the times some of this criticism from inside isn't even valid. It isn't even logical. It doesn't even make sense. Because remember, 
I get defeated because I'm not soul winning and I lose track of the fact that that's not the most important thing. That's not the foundation of my Christian life. The foundation of my Christian life has to do with assembling with the brethren. It has to do with loving God with all. It has to do with loving my neighbor with all. It has to do with observing all things in the scriptures, not just a few things that I'm good at, but also everything that I'm not good at. It embodies all of these things. I need to make sure that I'm not connecting what I believe is God's will to the routine that I'm in. Do you understand? Because if I put all of what I believe to be God's will in some sort of routine, I will be shaken from it. Think about it. If I believe that my will is to, or the will of God for my life is to get up and soul win every Saturday, is to go to church um, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, is to read the Bible through a hundred times in a year, is to pray 16 hours a day. If I believe that all of that routine is God's will and I'm able to do that maybe for a time, well, what happens in a scenario now where I get married and I don't have 16 hours a day to devote to God? What happens when, when suddenly I'm in a situation where my church doesn't have a Wednesday night or a midweek service and maybe they just have a Sunday evening? What happens when, when suddenly it, it becomes just, just almost impossible to go out and to get the the doors knocked like I used to and that's what I believe is the picture of God's will and I fall from it I'm defeated I'm done I'm not doing anything I'm not in God's will I get despondent I get sad and I'm moping and I'm mourning and you can fall into utter destruction in your Christian life if you just let that run its course depression and sadness and woefulness God's will is not about the routine. There's actually more than meets the eye to God's will, and it's that embodiment of the perfect Christian. Look at Job. He was deemed perfect. Though he was a sinner, he was praying for his family. He was, he was good in his finances. He ran a successful business. He cared for other people that were his employees and treated them really good. He had lots of friends. He counseled people. Job's life was deemed perfect, and it was a lot more than just Job went out and knocked on doors and was soul winning. And again, you all know well enough that I'm not trying to be up here and just poo-pooing on soul winning and pushing it down and saying, don't do it anymore, it's wrong, it's bad. I'm not against it. In fact, I'm very much for it. I'm just thinking and I'm feeling led of God that we are in a different season. And our season now reflects very much what Elijah was experiencing at this time. Look, Elijah was bold. And Elijah proclaimed the word of God with such boldness that he said, at my word, and he said what God, what he knew God felt and how he knew God would respond to their idolatry. But he said it so boldly that he said it as if it was himself saying it. Elijah was the man. He was a man of God, and I love his spirit. But look what happens next there in verse 2. And we're going to start to look at what we should do when we're by the brook, or what, how should we serve God when we're in a sila, when we're in a pause, when we're in a transitionary period. The first thing that we need to do is obey God. Look at verse 2. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there, so he went and did, according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. So what do you do in a pause? What do you do by that brook in the time that we're in right now? You obey God. It says there in verse 5, so he went and did according to the word of God. Whatever God in this time is impressing on you, whatever God is commanding you at this time as you read through the scriptures, whatever he's revealing unto you to do, simply obey it. And honestly, if part of that is to go and knock on doors in every apartment building still in Toronto, if that's what God has pressed upon your heart, that's what you got to do. I'm not choosing that. I haven't directed that, but my word from God and what he is telling me according to his word may be different than yours. When it comes to my walk with God and your walk with God and your walk with God, I have no idea what God is telling you. I can stand up here and preach to you what I believe he's telling me through the word and express it to you in such a way that you can get on board with the same plan. And that is how leadership works is essentially follow me as I follow Christ. And I'm just as you, in the same situation as you, looking to the Bible, praying to God and trying to hear from him and understand what I have to do next. 
I'm not in some special case where, where I have went up to the mount and I sit with God and he tells me as a man does his friend face to face like Moses had and I know exactly, no, I go to the Bible and I glean from the Bible and I pull from the Bible and I just try to obey God in whatever he's saying to me and whatever opportunity that he's set before me. The commands that you know to do, do those. Some of us always want to find out, what's the will of God? What's he want me to do? What's it? Well, how about this? Just pick one and do it. The next time you read your Bible, if God says, you know, you know, repent of this or turn from that or start doing this or do more of that, that's the next marching order for you. And simply obey him in that. Any command that you have in there, thou shalt not steal. Just don't steal if that's a problem that you have. Whatsoever command you have in there, you know, love your wife, love your husband, honor your parents. All of these simple commands, just do those. How? With all your heart. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and use those as the foundations of everything you do in obedience to God. What do you do by the brook? How do you serve God in a sea law? You obey him. Next, spend some time hidden. Look at verse 3. Get thee hence and turn eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. Hide thyself. There's nothing wrong with spending some time alone with God. There's nothing wrong with spending some time in prayer and meditation and hearing his word alone and separated from everyone else. Jesus often went and found a mountain apart so he could get away from the multitude. He could get away from just always preaching to people and ministering to people and helping people in this area. He removed himself so that he could hide himself. He even removed himself from the influence that he was trying to put upon his disciples. Why? So that he could be alone and serve God in the Selah, serve God in the pause, as if he was by the brook. Jesus himself says, enter into thy closet. And that's where we're to talk with God. The closet is simply a closed space. Go somewhere where no one else is and there seek God. That's what you do when you're by the brook. That's what you do when you're in a time like we are, in a, in a pause. And look, I'm looking forward to the sun breaking forth, and I bet you when March hits and suddenly all the snow's melted and that warmth comes and I can peel off my jacket, I'm going to be raring to go to get back out there and go door to door to door to door to door. But right now, I just don't feel like I'm led to do that, but I feel like I'm in an Elijah time. I feel like I personally am in a pause here. I can't wait till it's over the same way I believe Elijah couldn't wait till it was over and he could get back to ripping on Ahab, preaching at them, showing them the truth, showing them the scriptures, and being that strong prophet that he was. But for the time, at the command of God, don't miss that, at the command of God, at the word of God, he hid himself and he fell into a state of obedience unto him. Next, Eat bread and flesh, morning and evening. What do you do at the brook? What do you do and how do you serve in a selah? Eat bread and flesh, morning and meeting and evening. Some of us have more time right now. In verse 6 it says this, And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And so by a completely miraculous case, a raven bringing it to him, Elijah ate. Morning and evening, and morning and evening. We know what bread is likened unto in the Bible, and we know what flesh is likened unto in the Bible. It's Jesus as the bread of life. Get him in the morning. Get him in the evening. Strong meat of the word is what we're to eat if you've grown past milk. Get that in the morning. Get that in the evening. Get Christ at both times of the day. Get the word of God at both times of the day. That's what is being highlighted here. Eat bread and flesh in the morning and evening. And also this, he says, and he drank of the brook, that living water. And Elijah at this time, it was a drought. It had not rained, and yet there's this brook providing for him spiritual nourishment, water, and that was something that nobody else has. You know, you have access to somebody that nobody else has. You have the Word of God, and of course I have the Word of God, and anybody can certainly go to the Word of God, but the way that that living water will impact you through that Word of God is completely unique, and it's something that nobody else has. God has that specially for you. Just as God provided the raven to bring bread and flesh to Elijah, and just like God brought of that brook to give water unto Elijah, so God has a unique provision for you in that time of Selah in that time by the brook. 
We know the Bible says in Amos 8.11, and this was brought to my mind. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And there's your brook. Okay? He came in there, and that would have been another valid thing for Elijah to say. To just say, you know what? As the Lord liveth, you're not going to hear the word of God. There will be a famine of hearing the word of God. And that's where we are today. The word of God is precious to us, but it's of no consequence to the world at large. They do not care for the word of God. There's a famine of hearing it. It's not like there's a famine of having it. I probably have a couple Bibles in here. There's some over there. There might be some over there. We've all got four or five stacked up at home. There is Bible everywhere, and yet there's a famine of hearing it. People refuse to hear and hearken unto the words of God. But you have opportunity to go and drink of this brook. You have opportunity to go and eat of this flesh and eat of this bread morning and evening. And that's what you need to do at this time and in this sea law and by this brook. <clears throat> verse 7, as we read that, you'll see the impact of the very words that were spoken in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. As Elijah had prophesied, so it came to pass. The result of the words spoken in verse 1 had finally reached their course, and the brook dried up. And so God comes and has more for him. Verse 8, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth unto Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And so the next point, what do you do? You obey God. What do you do? You spend some time hidden. What do you do? Eat bread and flesh morning and evening. What do you do? Go where the Spirit leads. God here, he didn't have to point it out, but Elijah looks over and he's like, there's no more water here. So God says, all right, I've prepared a woman to sustain thee in Zarephath. Go. And so he picks up and goes where the Spirit, where the Word of God had led him. As in the hidden time and as he was praying, and, and, and wherever God would lead you at this time, whatever he tells you in that closet, the next step of obedience, whatever he tells you as you're eating bread and flesh and drinking of that water in the morning, just simply do it. Is that a desire to go and to talk to people while you're out walking like myself and Caleb have, have found wonderful opportunity to do? Is that going and calling up loved ones, family and friends and, and trying to reach them at this time? Is, is God leading you by His Spirit to simply just, just dedicate some time at home to loving your family and to, to working on things in the house and toiling there where you've, where you've maybe slacked off in the past? Wherever God by His Spirit is leading you, that's where you got to go. And here God just says, hey, pick up Elijah and go to Zarephath and there a woman will provide you. And he gets up and he goes. Now the next thing is that in this time of Selah, by this brook, talk to and minister to those that you encounter by the way. The Bible says of Abraham's servant as he went to find a wife for Isaac, I being in the way, the Lord led me. He was already in the way. He was already going where the Spirit had led him. And in that path, the Lord led him to the position that he needed to be so he could find what God wanted him to do. Minister to those you encounter, by the way, as you're following the Spirit, as you're eating bread and flesh in the morning and evening, as you've spent some time hidden and you're obeying God, go and minister to people. Look at verse 10 in the second half. It says, And when he came into the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. What a sad state for this widow. Elijah walks up to her and finds her in that sorry state, but he also knew the promise of God that this same widow would sustain him, so certainly she was not to die. And so he had a spiritual understanding of the reason why he had even got to her place in the first time. 
in the first place. Why he was staying there, he knew because God had promised provision and now here she is at her last straw. And so what does he do? He's about to minister to someone he encountered in the way that God led him. Verse 13, it says, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Can you imagine what words like that from a man of God like Elijah could have done to a woman that was at her last straw? Literally having two sticks to rub together that she could dress a little meal, her and her son could eat and then just die for the starvation that would come upon them. Elijah walks up and says, Fear not. Fear not. He ministered to her. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy sons. For thus saith the Lord. I would think if he would have just said that, people would have been like, what a monster. But he continues. He says, fear not. Go and do as you have said, but make some for me also. Why? Because for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail till the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. He says, God will keep providing. Why? Because he's promised that you will care for me. So I know that that cruise will not fail. I know that that barrel will not waste. I know that we will have sufficient enough to care for all of us and this house. He went and ministered unto her by saying, fear not. And he gave her good news from the word of God. The word of God was that Elijah would be sustained. And so he knew it was going to be through here. The good news is, is that I have what I need of the Lord because of this. So he brought her the good news. And we can take that by extension and bring people the gospel. Fear not. Why? Because God has promised me eternal life and I'm bringing it to you. And if you take it, you'll have the same. Until the Lord sendeth rain upon, until the end of days, until that last trumpet sounds. You will have access to those that same good news. Minister to those that you talk to by the or that you walk to by the way. How about this? Enjoy a meal with your household. Here's a good thing to do. When you're by the brook, when you are wondering what to do as you serve through the sea law, verse 15 it says, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And you know that's one of the commands of the early church, and our church as well, is to break bread one another. They continued in fellowship and the breaking of bread, and that's what we're charged to do many times in the Bible. It's actually marks of a good church, marks of a good fellowship, marks of a good family, and that's what we are together, is we're a family. We're, we're the family of the household of God, and so you can even take that into your own home and just eat a meal with your family, fellowship with them, break bread with them. That's a good thing to do when you're in the Selah. How do you serve your family? Just eat with them. Break bread with them. Enjoy that break. Enjoy that time by the brook with them. Verse 16 and down to 19, it says, And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, as if there was any doubt, right? Which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was sore that there was no breath left in him. And he said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance, to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft. And there he abode and laid him upon his own bed. What's the next thing we ought to do? Obey God. Take some time to be hidden. Eat bread and flesh morning and evening. Go where the Spirit leads you and minister and talk to people you encounter by that way. Enjoy a meal with your household and pray. Pray, verse 20. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. He's praying in the house with this family and with these people that he has fellowshiped with, that he has ministered to. He's praying for them. You ought to do the same in your home at this time. What a great ministry that is compared to going out and serving people at their doors that are completely str complete strangers. What if you could serve and love and pray for and minister to people of your own house? We're missing out on that big time, I believe, in Christianity. Take care of your own. Take care of your own house. Then serve the people that are out there. Take care of your church. Take care of things in the church. Then go and reach out and serve the community. Pray for people of your family and pray for people in the church. Then go and serve out there. That's the foundation. The church is the foundation. Your household is your foundation. Next is 
Heal the people that are home. You're praying for people that are in your home? Go and heal some people that are home. Verse 22, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him into his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. He's healing at home. He's helping those that he lives and abides with. And the final one, have a testimony at home, second to last, last in the scriptures. And the woman said unto Elijah, Now, now by this, I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Isn't this amazing? Isn't this amazing that after he had performed, basically, and I'm sure she heard of it, this miracle where he goes before the king and says, you know, in boldness, it will not rain until I say so. And it stops. Then he goes and spends some time in the wilderness. He leaves the wilderness. He goes to this widow. He tells the widow in the word of the Lord the same thing, that God's promised to provide for me. Your food will not fail. You will live. Fear not. She accepts that. And they live together for a while. They, they, they enjoy meals together. They're prayed one for another. There's healing that takes place. And after all of that miracle that happened with the government, miracle that happened with the provision, finally, once she sees care in the home, meals and fellowship, prayers, healing at home. Finally, the testimony comes for which she's like, now I know you're a man of God. That's showing you what speaks louder. It's not me going out and yelling at the government and telling them their wickedness and revealing unto the world out there their sins and their shortcomings and the judgment of God that's coming upon them. That doesn't impact my testimony as much as praying at home healing at home, enjoying meals in my house, ministering to those that I come into contact with on the way, people that I actually know and see and, and engage with personally. That's what rounds out my testimony so that the woman will look at the man of God, the woman of God, and say, now I know that you serve God. Now I know that you are um, in truth. The word of truth is in thy mouth, and it is true. Now I know everything that you have said to be true. Now I know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Why? Because of the testimony that went on at home, not for the great ministry that went on out there. And so, what do we do when by the brook? What do, how do we serve God in the Selah? Obey God. Spend some time hidden. Hide thyself, he said. Eat bread and flesh in the morning and in the evening. Go and get that word before bedtime. Go and get that word first thing in the morning. And drink of that wonderful living water. What do we do by that brook? How do we serve God in the Selah? Go where the Spirit leads. Just, just ask, God, lead me somewhere today. Show me where to go. And, and when, you, when you come into contact with somebody, by the way, minister to them. Talk to them. Tell them the good news. Tell them to fear not. Next, enjoy a meal with your household. Have, have supper with your family during this time. Things have been so busy. I think that's something that, that we lose track of sometimes. Just sitting down and enjoying food with your family. Next, pray at home. Next, heal at home. Start there. And therefore, have a good testimony at home. And a good testimony that you are indeed a man or woman of God. That the word of the Lord is in you. And that word in your mouth, mouth is truth. And finally, just be patient. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Long suffer and, and be patient. Elijah, Elijah was this great man of God that went out and was, was active in his ministry to the world. And now he's paused. He spent some time by a brook. He spent some time in, in the house with, with this, this widow woman. And he had to learn patience. Patience is, is, a, is a virtue that you need to add to your faith. And we're not patient enough in the days that we live in. So sometimes everything that's going on here and the fact that we can't do what we want to do, we can't do our heart's desire and go out and, and minister in the streets of this city the same way we did before. Perhaps that's all there just to teach us this art of patience, waiting on the Lord, asking after Him and, and com completely just saying, you know what, God, when you say go, I'll go. When you say stay, I'll stay. One of the hardest things to do in the Christian life is to understand that when you pray, you're not answered right away. You pray sometimes, you have to wait. You have to be patient. You have to, you have to wait for God's timing. 
My timing is always way faster than God's timing, but God's timing is always way better than my timing. And that's what we need to understand. So those are just 10 different points that I see in the story here of Elijah. Look, he was in a wicked, forward, godless nation, given wholly to idolatry. And in that time, yeah, he went out and proclaimed the truth that, hey, God's going to judge this. But then God commanded him, go take a break. Let me judge this people. Let me work in this people. Take care of your home. I'll call you again later. Do you know what happens next? Elijah meets Obadiah. A whole bunch of prophets. He yokes up with them. And he's found. He's not the only, he's the only one. He's not alone. He's got friends. You know what happens next? He goes and he stands off against the wicked, godless prophets of Baal. and has fire fall upon him. Look, there's lots of ministry on our horizon and in the future. There's lots to do, okay? Just as best as you can, serve in the sea law. Wait by the brook. Be patient, okay? Don't beat yourself up. The worst thing you can do is start beating yourself up. Look, I gave you a list of 10 things to do here. And, and you haven't arrived in all of these. Work on this. There's lots of more valuable things to the Christian than just going out and working. A lot of people that are about soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, maybe the most important thing, they do it in their flesh. They do it for to be seen of men. Do you think they have an obedient heart? No, but you can go and you can in this time when you're not doing the outward works, learn to be obedient in your heart and in your spirit. You can learn to spend some time hidden with him. We're no good at that. I mean, as soon as I get into a quiet space, my brain goes this way and that way. I think of what I have to do. I want to check my phone. I want to, you know, just distractions. Learn to be hidden. Learn to spend some time with God. How about eating bread and flesh and getting that water from the word in the morning and in the evening? Not good at that, okay? I'll get it sometimes in the evening, but then my... My eyes are dimming, or I'll, or I'll get into it a little bit in my breaks, and, and my, my mind, again, is just all over the place. I'm not sitting down and getting that, that good meal from God because I didn't take time to get hidden first. Therefore, I'm not being obedient. See, these all kind of build upon each other. These, this is Christianity. Go where the Spirit leads. You know how you do that? You have to be sensitive to how the Spirit talks. I don't think I'm sensitive enough. I hear too much noise from the world. And that still small voice is, is, is blocked out as a result. Ministering to those you encounter by the way. Am I faithful to go and as I pump gas, lean over and talk to the gentleman across the way? Am I faithful to give a card to every single person I buy a coffee from? Am I faithful to catch every single person at work and just give them a little bit of, of, of encouragement? Tell them fear not. No, no, no. I... I, I I relinquish that responsibility. I don't do that. I sin in those areas by, by omission and, and, and omitting to do these weightier matters. How about enjoying a meal with your household? Okay. I don't sit down faithfully with my family and eat and partake of that breaking of bread. We're distracted at the dinner table if we do get there at all. Usually we're just grabbing something and eating and running off to our next event, our next activity, right? Praying. No one prays enough. If you think you pray enough, you need to start praying and asking God for forgiveness for thinking you're praying enough. <laughs> we can never pray enough. How about healing at home? Have we, have we broken up any relationships? Has the time that we've spent in lockdown together actually caused more of a wedge to come between us? Because that's happening, certainly. People are fighting because they've never had to be in the same space for more than a couple days without the distractions of the world out there. Is there healing that needs to take place at home? Do you need to call up some family members that you've hurt when you were more zealous in the early part of your Christianity? Have you been a bad testimony amongst the people that you know personally? Do you need to heal at home? If you do all those things, you will have a good testimony. And it starts with the home. It starts with the church. And all the ministry that happens out there is sprung forth of a good foundation that is the solid Christian life. <clears throat> do you know why the scribes and Pharisees were hypocrites? Because they could go and do the outward without having any change inwardly. Our Christianity, if it's going to last, needs to start here. Start with me. Start with a, a right heart, a right mind, a right spirit. Then I can minister 
in the way I'm intended to. And just be patient. Be patient in this time. Quit worrying. Quit beating yourself up. Quit fussing. Quit getting too excited. Try to try to enjoy this time because I did it in the first lockdown. I look back and I'm like, I wasted so much time. Now I'm back to work. Now I'm busy. Now, now there's a baby on the way. Now there's just life caught up with me. But back then I had a time by the brook. I had a sea law that I could have taken advantage of and really got some Christian growth done. But I missed out. Okay, here we are in another opportunity to get some Christian growth in. Don't miss out. And so fulfill the will of God for your life. Amen.